In episode number 401 of the Reasons I'm Broke podcast, we cover AMC's refusal to play movies from Universal Pictures. We also go over some of the issues coming up with DC's multi-distributor plan. And finally, we have Scholastic's reveal of the Goosebumps show. All of this and so much more on today's show. And welcome to the award-winning The Reasons I'm Broke podcast, bringing you the reasons we're broke, ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. I am your almighty Emperor Papa Kelly. And I am Magma Admin Daniel. <laughs> you can control in some lava over there? Trying to. <laughs> For those of you joining us for the very first time, the way we form at the show is we go over some news. We have our Patreon shout-outs. Typically, we have a comic book highlight. Of course, there are no new comic books this week, but we do go into the Brocat block, which has some Brocat questions and what Daniel and I have done with our week. Starting things off with the revival of my childhood with Scholastic Entertainment, Sony Pictures TV, and feature film producer Neil H. Moritz, who told Original Film that they are set to develop a live-action TV adaptation series of Goosebumps. Neil said, quote, I loved making the Goosebumps movies and can't wait to bring even more of R.L. Stein's incredible stories to life through a high-end television series that speaks to both adults and kids alike, end quote. Goosebumps has sold more than 350 million English language books in print and international editions in 32 languages, so this makes Goosebumps one of the best-selling book series in publishing history. Do you know what it also makes Goosebumps? What's that? Creepy, and I'm not about it. You're not going to be watching the no! show? You didn't watch the original either, did you? No. I did watch the movie with Jack Black. That was and a good was, one. He was just like silly, so it was, <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> but I feel like when they go into a TV series, it's going to be more kind of like along the lines of Are You Afraid of the Dark, mm -hmm. which I watched with you a few times, and I was like, nah. This is clearly <laughs> made in the 90s, and I know it's going to happen, but nah. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's shows for kids and like, and adults alike. That's what they say. But <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I know they did a revival of Are You Afraid of the Dark about a year or two ago, and it was not in the same format as the original, where it was a bunch of kids in a campfire, mm -hmm. and then they told an original story, and then they all went home. But in the revival, it seemed like these were kids that were trapped in a world that did have these spooky aspects to them. Mm -hmm. So that's where it all changed to me. The whole format wasn't the same. It was instead a horror TV show that had the same title of Are You Afraid of the Dark? So my main thing is I hope that Goosebumps is something similar where they adapt some of Arl Stein's stories or even do original stories based on those same monsters and characters and try to do that episode format where they're just standalone stories. But I don't know if they will do that. I know if they don't, I probably won't be there. But I'm also, I guess I'm not the demographic, even though it's based on a series that I grew up with. Are there any kids that are going to care about Goosebumps, the show? Probably. I don't know. When their parents make them watch it, like, oh, I love this. And then they realize how scary it was. <laughs> Did you watch the original show? I watched the yeah the show. I read the books mm -hmm. as well. I watched the Are You Afraid of the Dark, which was like the much less, I guess, scary version of those that two. That was less scary? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you go back and watch them all, they're kind of, I guess they're creepy, the Goosebumps cartoons, mm -hmm. but... Like the girl with the mask, I forgot what it's called, like the living mask. That one, they actually put together some pretty good effects on the masks to make them look really creepy. And then I I used to, the books for the Night of the Living Dummy used to scare me, but the show, they kind of changed the way he looked and it wasn't as creepy. Mm. So yeah, I do think though that they were scarier than Are You Afraid of the Dark, which were more like... Like, even the last one we saw was about a guy, a kid that doesn't know he's a ghost, and then he goes to the afterlife. It's yeah, not it was really still scary. No, not we at all. We saw that one with that ghost where the sister became the ghost and was stolen by the ghost, and he was scary. Yeah, there's the, but that's goosebumps every time. Oh, <laughs> you know, no. that's every episode. No, why would you watch this? Why did you like this? I loved it. Yeah, I really did. I got caught up in that. And then, like, 10 years later, five years later, was Animorphs. That was a big thing. And then Harry Potter right after that. Well, you can share this with Leo when he's like 15. Did you guys ever do the Scholastic Book Fair at yeah, your school? Yeah, uh, something similar, yeah. 
Did you get like all the neat erasers also every time? Like <laughs> there, there were some pretty cool ones. I didn't. I remember getting, and I take that back. I remember two years where we had the Scholastic Book Fair, but normally you just got like a big pamphlet and mm-hmm. you could choose from there and like purchase things. And even in like fifth grade, I bought a photography book because I was like, this looks really interesting. But then my parents just got me some really crappy cameras, <laughs> so I couldn't use it. But it, I mean, it was definitely a lot of fun. I wasn't ever allowed to read or watch scary things. I remember my cousin was huge into Goosebumps. Absolutely loved it. Had all the books and everything. And my parents were like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. I used to love the Scholastic Book Fairs because usually it would be during class. Mm-hmm. So it's like, all right, so you everyone. To skip class, of yeah, course. Yeah, line up and let's go down the hallway to the gym. It was always in the gym. Mm-hmm. And then they had it all set up and you can look. I, most of the time I didn't have money. So I was just kind of, maybe I had a dollar and I can buy some of the erasers. But yeah, now you bring up that catalog and that was the way in which you can like, your parents could write out a little check and throw it in there and then we can order the books. Mm -hmm. And from what I remember, they arrived like a month or two later. Right. So it was almost like a previews catalog (laughs) type of thing with the Scholastic books. And I I know that the Goosebumps were always like a month or two behind Mm because you can go to Barnes and Noble and you'd get the latest Mm -hmm. ones right away. So I do remember not getting Goosebumps through Scholastic, but getting stuff that I normally couldn't get like the drawing books. You mentioned the photography books, just the neat other things that Scholastic was also publishing. It's just bringing me back to <laughs> elementary school. It's really That's cool. That's something great that you have to share with Leo though, is, you know, taking him to a bookstore and picking out a new mm. book or to his local comic shop and getting to pick out something every single week. I see that now with customers. They'll mm-hmm. bring in their kid. They'll have their own subscription to a lot of these all ages comics and then the dollar books is what they always Mm. go through and they're like all right you can pick out three of these and then they'll pick out three dollar books and they'll read them and uh, usually they always ask me like are these appropriate i'm like if they're marvel or dc if they watch the movies they'll be fine don't go for the image ones (laughs) let's let's (laughs) avoid unnatural let's avoid the walking dead (laughs) and that was the that's another thing the walking dead it's not as popular now so i don't run across this issue there's no more kids or teens picking up walking dead trades anymore but five years ago when they were, they would, I'd always tell them it was almost back like to my GameStop days with mm-hmm. Grand Theft Auto and stuff where I'd yes. have to warn the parents. And I'd always tell them, just so you know, the Walking Dead comic is way more intense than the show. Oh, but I mean, he watches the show though. I'm like, well, I'm just letting you know, it's way gorier. It's way more, it's way more graphic than what the show does. So, and sometimes that would. You know, yeah, I just did my bit, right? Sometimes they'd buy them, sometimes they Don't wouldn't. lie. You enjoyed the disappointment when the parents were like, oh, we're not going to get this. Oh, man. <laughs> I did at GameStop. Like, those those were awesome. Just because Grand Theft Auto, it's like, the kid's 13. You can go to the strip club and you can pick up hookers and shit. Like, <laughs> what the fuck are you guys doing? Well, I look forward to the days that you can also disappoint Leo <laughs> when he picks out a book that's too graphic. Moving on over to the movie side, which is going to be a huge topic on this week's Mm -hmm. episode, NBC Universal CEO Jeff Schell recently spoke out about the success of Trolls World Tour after it released on Video On Demand and what it could mean for future films. We do have a quote from Jeff, quote, The results for Trolls World Tour have exceeded our expectations and demonstrated the viability of paid video on demand. As soon as theaters reopen, we expect to release movies on both formats, end quote. So, so far, they are the only movie studio to go this route Mm -hmm. of we're going to simultaneously release our movies on paid video on demand and on the movie theater side. Do you think this is a bold move for them? Do you think this is them pulling the trigger a little too early based on one movie that did really well? I have a lot of thoughts on this, but we have a lot of news, and I feel like we need all the information before I can really dive in and say, yeah, this is what I feel about that. All righty. Yeah, let's finish off the news story. So in response to this, to him saying, yep, this is what we're going to do, AMC got their panties in a twist, (laughs) and they are saying, no, we're not going to show your movies anymore then. In a quote from AMC CEO President Adam Aaron, via The Hollywood Reporter, he said, quote, 
It is disappointing to us, but Jeff's comments as to Universal's unilateral actions and intentions have left us with no choice. Therefore, effective immediately, AMC will no longer play any Universal movies in any of our theaters in the United States, Europe, or the Middle East. This policy affects any and all Universal movies per se, goes into effect today, and as our theaters reopen, it is not some hollow or ill-considered threat. End quote. So they pretty much said, mm, if you're not exclusive with us, we're not going to date at all. <laughs> if you, what is it? If they don't eat with me, then they don't no, eat yeah, at all. <laughs> That's yes. what it is. They pulled up beast. <laughs> but why did they make the, this decision? So Trolls World Tour made over $100 million in three weeks in just VOD rentals. That's insane. Aaron went on to say that this new policy isn't just for Universal, but extends to any movie maker who unilaterally abandons current windowing practice, absent good faith negotiations between us, so that they as distributor and we as exhibitor both benefit and neither are hurt from such changes. So essentially, you got to talk to us before you decide where to release your movie. So these are pretty big bannings or non-showings because among Universal's notable current film franchises, we've got The Fast and the Furious, which is massive, Jurassic Park, Despicable Me, The Purge, Kung Fu Panda, the upcoming James Bond. There's a lot of big ticket movies that AMC is refusing to carry, and they're mm -hmm. saying that it's not a hollow threat. So I perceive this, and I think I still do, as AMC going, all right, we just won't carry your movies, but they don't really intend to not carry them. They're just this is a message to Universal, and if Universal backs off and says, all right, well, then we'll just show them at Regal, your biggest competitor, then that could mean that other movie studios will go, if they're doing fine on video on demand and we can make money on both, then we will also release ours. And so far, no other studio has announced that they're going to go that route, mm -hmm. but this could mean a huge change for AMC, and I can sort of see why they would take that approach of let's... I, I actually don't blame either one. I don't I'm I'm not on a side here. Like I love going to the movie theater and I don't want them to go away, so I'm leaning towards AMCs mm -hmm. and Cinemarks and everyone else. But I'm also like I get why Universal's taking that route. I'm really split here. Yeah, I definitely see both sides. I think and we've talked about this um, probably a few episodes ago, but coming out of this, every single company needs to evolve. Every single company is going to have to change in some way. I think this is a pretty big jump to say just based off one movie, right? But a hundred million, how much did they make on the first Trolls? That I don't know. Not they must have made a shit like, ton though I, to have a sequel. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe not, but a hundred million in three weeks mm. is a lot of money. And yeah, you could say, well, you know, parents can't go anywhere and kids really want to see this. But at the end of the day, I don't think even if you release it, let's say, OK, it comes out into theaters on release date and two weeks later, it's paid video on demand. I I don't foresee a change into this being what drives movie theaters out of business. Right. You still have people like us who want to go and get that experience and sit and get away from our child <laughs> for three hours, right? To sit and enjoy that date night. And yes, our movies theater is also going to have to evolve within this and offer maybe different things or a different kind of experience. Absolutely, probably. But I really don't see releasing a movie paid video on demand, and I really think the format needs to be two or three weeks after theatrical release. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as the end all because you're still going to charge $20 for a movie. Right. And realistically, maybe that means more people can see it because if I don't have money to take my family of six to the theater, but we really want to see this movie, we're not going to see it. We're going to wait till it releases on video. Oh, but now I can rent it for $20 for my family of six. That's half the price of us going to see a movie. We can make popcorn at home. Or maybe I have a condition where I can't leave my house to go see these things. And now I have the ability to kind of get that movie theater experience without having to wait months for a movie to come out. I equate this to the digital release of comic books mm -hmm. and to comic book shops. That was a big fear about 15 years ago when the digital market really rose and people were saying, I don't have to leave my home. I can download my comics and read them that way. And it ended up not affecting comic shops. I think less than 10% and even many comic shops ended up going up in price 
after they did the the digital model. So I think that's what's going to happen with movie theaters as well. People that still want to go to the theater are going to go. People mm-hmm. that want to stay at home, then they can rent it. Because to me, $20 is still a lot. And if that ends up becoming the standard of, all right, we're going to release it at home and we're going to release it in theaters. My main concern is, yes, I'm not going to rent it for 20, but that the rental prices, which are right now like $3, $4 are going to go up. Mm -hmm. If people are willing to pay 20, then they might go, well, why don't we raise the rental price to seven, $8 instead if we show that clearly people are willing to pay 20 for it. And it's the same thing as renting a movie, except you're renting it during the period in which it's in theaters, like Bloodshot, like Trolls, those are $20. Right now, I can rent movies that have been out in theaters for a while for 3 or $4, but I'm afraid, once again, that that's going to drive those prices up. I don't think that it would, because, again, I think that that $20 price tag is... In my mind, when I'm looking at that, so I'm not looking at a Medea movie we're going to rent for $3 and say, well, this is like a movie theater experience because it's in movies right now Mm -hmm. or in theaters right now. I think that people are really looking at that trolls, at that bloodshot and saying, oh, this is in theaters. I'm going to make a movie theater experience at home and I'm okay paying that $20 for that movie theater experience that I'm expecting. And you're not going to do that with a movie that you can buy for 10 Right. You're you're not going to rent a movie for 20 when you can purchase it for 10 or 15 or they're, they're really going to have to understand that you have to weigh undercut services like Amazon or Target or Best Buy that'll price match all these things when a lot of times these movies go on sale for 10 or 15 and you could mm-hmm. just get it then. So there, I don't foresee that changing, but I do think it's a way to expand these movies to get them to a broader audience and to get the money now and when they purchase it later, whereas maybe you just would have had the purchase price. Normally, we would have this question in the Brocap block from Bobby, but it so ties into this movie theater headline that let's just knock it out now and include it because I know some of this is answered in our discussion already. So let's go ahead and go through it. At Cuban Slim asks, quote, Let's continue that discussion regarding movie theaters. First, for the drive-in, you tune your radio into a station so you get great audio in your vehicle, or currently, probably connect by Bluetooth. Second, what's your thoughts on the success of Trolls World Tour and how it made $100 million in three weeks from at-home video on demand versus the first version that was in theaters for five months and didn't make that much? Does this give studios the data they were speculating on for years regarding direct on-demand releases versus theatrical releases? Money talks, and this proves it can be done, or is the data tainted due to the audience not having a choice to go out? In my opinion, this needs to be conducted after theaters are open to determine the true value and effectiveness. Thoughts? End quote. So as I mentioned, some of this we just covered, but the question here that I really pulled from this is whether or not Trolls World Tour is, as he says, uh, tainted data, where Mm -hmm. is it just because we're in a quarantine period that this movie made that much? The same question came up with the Jordan documentary with Tiger King, where if these things would have really streamed (laughs) that much, (laughs) if people weren't stuck at home and needed something to watch, how many families rented Trolls just because it's like, look, you need something to watch. This just hit video on the man. Here you go. Yes and no. I will say that Probably a lot of people who also rented this for their kids had kids that they wouldn't have taken to the theaters. Again, I am not taking our two and a half year old to the theater, but if a movie I thought he might like released on demand, I'd be like, yeah, okay, let's have a movie night. Let's make a big deal about it. And I think that this is a great time, and I talk about it a lot at the store that I work at. This is a really great time to reevaluate, but also to really see what's possible. So it's not just for theaters to say, yeah, hey, this is something that's possible for us. It's for families to say, that was a really fun experience. I get that we're stuck at home, but we spent $20, we popped popcorn, we pulled out candy, and we got to have this movie theater experience going back to that point with our children that I would not have taken to a movie theater because they were screaming through the whole movie, they were talking, right? But I didn't bother anybody else and I was just at home. I do think it's a very small... Sample group, absolutely. It was one movie Mm -hmm. that did much better than the movie before it, and these were the circumstances around it. But I don't think that it's impossible to say that they could have continued success with things like this. I think kids' movies are a smarter option because, again, you have that two-and-a-half-year-old that you're not taking to the theater. You can watch it at home, 
and and start this family tradition with them. So to wrap up this news story, do you think that Universal or AMC, which one of those two will back off if either one of them? AMC is going to back <laughs> off 100%. Universal just looked at this movie and said, we made so much more money by releasing it this way. And if we release it in theaters and nobody purchased it this way, they're still going to theaters. We're still making that money. This is just extra revenue, an extra source of income that we can bring in that further supports us doing other things. And AMC is not going to give up that Jurassic World money. They're not going to give up James Bond money. They may be saying this, but I also think they're doing it extremely prematurely when they could get with Universal and say, hey, what kind of agreement? How can you sweeten the pot for us? Right. That's great that you're doing this. But how do we keep drawing people into our theaters to see your movie? But he said it wasn't a hollow threat, Kelly. (laughs) It's definitely a hollow. Which one do you think? Who do you think is going to back off? I I don't know, because it would drive a lot of competition to places like Regal and Cinemark. So that's my biggest thing. And I think the one to lose more here is AMC. Of course. There's actually a local AMC to us that is also (laughs) looking to lose out on quite a bit. Despite giving advance notice to their landlords, the owners of the Florida Mall are suing AMC for failing to pay the $52,153.87 monthly rent. Florida Mall, to anyone not local to not or even not in Florida is a pretty big tourist destination Mm -hmm. for Brazilians. For anyone going to Disney or Universal Studios, that's the mall to go to. That and Millennia are the two malls. But I noticed that Florida Mall is way more touristy than than that one. So it's huge in this era of quote-unquote dying malls that people like to, you know, put everyone in. This is one of those exceptions where Florida Mall is always really busy. It's always packed. That's where Eminem World used to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, Crayola World is there. Right. It's the kind of mall where they have it's more than just shops. It's also like an activity place. Mm-hmm. Doesn't isn't one of the clothing stores also like a skateboarding rink as well? Like Vans, one of those. Yeah, yeah, they have like one of those places where you can simulate surfing too, mm-hmm. where you get on the water and it's actually there in the mall. So you get to buy surfing clothes and then actually go surfing. Right. And it's also a mall that has an Apple store and a Microsoft. Microsoft store oh, yeah. and I think also a Sony store. Yeah, so it's like, I'm pretty sure and they're it's got all two there. Game Stops in it because one used to be an EB Games. Oh yes, but they just got both open. Uh, it's got like a rotate. Anyway, it's a massive. <laughs> it's got a hotel connected it to does. it. It does. <laughs> it does. So that's that's what we're dealing with. It's a serious mall. It is a money maker for for the landlords and for everyone in there. But the landlords are seeking more than $7.5 million in damages. The association also sued other tenants, including Fitness International, Taco Bell, and Discovery Clothing Company. All right, that's where I draw the line. You leave fucking Taco Bell alone. <laughs> but according to the breach of contract, the COVID-19 pandemic does not excuse these tenants from their rent. And I believe that was the case with our store as well, the comic shop, Mm -hmm. where they didn't have to work with us on the rent. And I don't think anyone does. It's not covered under this pandemic. But it goes to what Spoon was saying on Discord of if these tenants are proven to be monthly payers and usually are always on time and they're bringing in people to the mall, why not work with them so that they stay in the mall instead of suing them and then having them pull out of their contract at a later time? Yeah, I go back and forth with this. I think that landlords should show a lot of grace during this time because, yeah, a lot of businesses are massively in the red right now, 60, mm. 70, 80% down from where they were, especially if it's a mall and they can't be open. On the flip side, I will say businesses like Taco Bell do have a lot of backing. You cannot tell me that our Taco Bell is in the red right now. (laughs) Okay, our local Taco Bell is definitely making money, mostly from us. (laughs) So they do have backing from other resources that they should potentially be able to tap into to continue to pay their rent. It's 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 a tough one. I don't know. And I don't know what kind of conversations these landlords had with AMC or these other businesses previously to say, hey, listen, we know what you make. <laughs> we know you have a backup. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can work out something and you're going to get some months for free later on. Right. Maybe that's how it works out and they need to pay it up front. We don't know all the conversation. We just see the one side of the story where it's like ah, AMC didn't pay. We're suing. Right. Yeah. I mean. 
I still think you're right though, even though they are sources, you know, they have money from other sources, as you mentioned, like a huge Taco Bell or a huge company like AMC. But from my experience at working at GameStop, even though they were tied into a big corporation, each store is still responsible for their own profit and loss. And I I know some companies treat stores like that of, well, this location isn't making its money. Let's drop it as opposed to, well, we've got all this money that we made from these mm-hmm. stores. Let's just pump it into that and keep it open. So I do think stores, locations, even if they're a part of a corporation, are still more on their own as far as the amount of money they individually have to work with. So I do feel for these tenants and and I get that you need to make your money as a landlord. But as you said, there's a lot of places that cannot pay the rent. And if you're going to go through the process of suing big companies for it, I don't know. I think that's a lot of work based on that as opposed to just saying, here's a free month of rent. Just we'll tack it on to the end of your contract or something like that. And then you're going to go through the whole legal process as opposed to, I don't know, forcing them, I guess, to get you your money. It's just not a good move for from my perspective as a non-landlord. <laughs> they said, you're not going to play Universal movies? Then we want our money. <laughs> <laughs> Flipping on over to the comic book side, we do have some more word on DC going with other distributors. Alan Gill of Ultimate Comics will also not be going with these other distributors and had this to say. Quote, Diamond Comics should not be punished for doing the right thing and shutting down their operations to protect their staff and to stop the flow of comics to retailers all over the world at a time when comic book stores could not open. It would have literally driven all the physical stores out of business. I'm standing with Jeppy and Diamond Comics. Ultimate Comics will be carrying new comics, including the ones shipping early. You will not miss issues in May when Diamond is rolling again. End quote. We do have an, another quote here from Paul S. at Comic Biz, who said, quote, Both Diamond UK and Diamond US are and have been great trading partners, and I applaud them both for protecting their staff by closing during this dreadful pandemic. We do have the option of bringing DC books in from the US, but we will remain loyal to Diamond and urge other retailers, especially UK retailers, to do the same, end quote. Retailers who chose to go with DC's distributors are reportedly running into miscommunication issues and shipping delays. That's another reason why our store decided not to go with the multi-distributor option. As we said last week, it's only a few books. They're not big hitters. It's only a couple weeks early. They're in a time when people don't have that expendable income. They did. It didn't make sense. Did not make sense to go with that model. And now it's even proven it more with look, there's going to be hiccups and there they are. So it's not worth the headache. We're going to stick with Diamond and, you know, we're a few weeks away from those books. You know, right now they're telling us May 20th. So it's fine. It's fine to wait, get our numbers accurate, not deal with shipping delays, not deal with any of those headaches, not deal with the numbers, stick with Diamond and we're good. Do you think Steve set all this up to just make Diamond look better? <laughs> he sabotaged their <laughs> shipping and he robbed, he he sent the crew down to the warehouses <laughs> Beat go, some guys go up. Go down to the docks. <laughs> meet, <laughs> that, sh- meet that shipment over there. Make sure those books are under the water. And they just push all the crates down. <laughs> My other question is, do you think- Swim with the fishes. Do, do you think DC is legitimately like, legitimately doing this? Or do you think they're just like, ah, let's give these guys money? <laughs> what do you mean? the do, Doing what? Like thinking that this will actually be successful for them. With these other distributors. There's a quote that Steve gives, and I'm I'm agreeing with him. I don't think it's DC's intention to try to make a multi-distributor model out of all this pandemic closures. I think it is what he says of they're just trying to get books out out of necessity and out of trying to find a solution to this. They made this, this decision at a time when we weren't sure how long Diamond mm-hmm. was going to be closed for. So they were prepping as, well, just in case they're closed for months and months, here's other options that we can have to still get these books out in some way to some distributors that are still open. Turns out that maybe it's not as long a closure as maybe they were expecting or anyone was preparing for, which is a good thing because we did practice that staying at home and washing our hands and we still continue to do so. So I don't know. I don't think it's badly intended. I think they were just trying to find a a long-term solution. 
So it's great that Steve is still on DC's side, still sounds like he wants to work with them, but he also pointed out that restaurants have taken a much bigger hit as people have been eating at home instead of going out to eat. But with comic book readers and collectors, they still want to eat. <laughs> well, they don't want to eat that. <laughs> they want to read Batman number 92, and they won't want a gap in their reading collection. So he believes that there's going to be a pent-up demand from diehards. And I think when he's talking about restaurants, I do think people are going out to eat, but they're going to fast food restaurants. They're obviously yeah. not going to sit down restaurants because they can't. So in his case, he's kind of comparing that to, you know, people have to eat, whereas readers, they want to be able to go in and get their comics. So he doesn't believe that there's going to be any kind of slowdown in the industry. We do have a quote here from Jeppy. Quote, I can't control the president or the governors anymore, <laughs> but in my mind, we're going to ship. You can't destroy our industry with two months, end quote. What's he mean by that? that Control the president or the governors anymore? Listen, he used you were to. giving me all this these facts about this man last night, and I was like, he is a mob boss. <laughs> he owned the Baltimore Orioles for a couple years. He apparently controlled the president and governors for a few years down in Gotham or <laughs> in somewhere. <laughs> and he's owned Diamond since like 83 or 82. <laughs> Dude, what, what were his favorite comics again? <laughs> he likes Archie comics and the Batman ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's never read a comic book in his life. <laughs> <laughs> he also bought up the competitors from Diamond during his time as owner. And he's still continuing. I mean, the guy's 70 years old. He's sitting on uh, a monopoly of distribution. <laughs> this is crazy. He's definitely, do you think he's only distributing comics? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty, kind of sketchy. I'm pretty sure there's some drugs in those boxes. You should have it tested. <laughs> you, you and these, this I, thought of him as a Gotham mob boss. Listen, and I so hope that one day he hears this podcast and he's flattered by my thoughts that he's really a mob boss because he's the coolest mob boss I know. He grew up in Little Italy. <sighs> I mean, that's he something, is. right? 100%. 100% mob boss. Jeppy also insisted that his furloughed employees will be brought back and through their stimul stimulus checks, some are doing better than they were before. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of admitting you didn't pay them You're as right. much as. <laughs> My staff is doing fine. They found other things. <laughs> <laughs> he also confirmed that free comic book day is still happening this year and will instead have a fall date. No word on if this affects Halloween Comic Fest. Do you think they should just merge the two? Yes. Free Comic Book Day on Halloween? Free Comic Book Halloween Fest. My main concern is people do, I think they still go out for Halloween, right? They still take their yeah. kids out around the neighborhood. How many would not go to, or maybe if it's a, a day-long event. Yeah. If you do it on a Saturday, call it Halloween Comic, just call it Free Comic Book Day. Put the Halloween Comic Fest, Fest books there. I know they said it was going to be summer at first, but now that he said fall, so I don't know. Like maybe they should merge it. Maybe they should have both. I don't know the answer here. I think you should just merge it because I think Halloween's on a Saturday this year, right? So there's there's no dad or person who's an avid fan of comic books who's going to say it's noon on Halloween. We are not going to go to the comic book store and we are instead going to go out to get to get candy. No, nobody's going to do that. You're going to give candy at the door so kids can dress up and come in. And it's going to be this huge thing, even mm -hmm. bigger than regular Halloween Comic Fest. And maybe they'll come out when typically they wouldn't have because Halloween Comic Fest and Free Comic Book Day mean two different things in people's minds. So now you have even more people who are going to come back next year. We would definitely have the most cosplayers of any Free so Comic many. Book Day if that were the case. Yeah, <laughs> That'd it would be, be awesome. amazing. Final bit of news this week, and it is also from Diamond. Diamond distributors have started taking final order cutoffs again from retailers for books previously solicited. Quote here from Diamond, who told Newsarama last Saturday evening, quote, We continue to work towards a mid to late May resumption of weekly comic distribution, but numerous factors will affect the actual date we are able to deliver our first weekly shipment. Placeholder dates are an approximation of when we hope to resume weekly operations, but are not yet firm. End quote. So that's that May 20th date mm. where, and even I've been telling people like, even though they gave us this date and this is when we're supposed to get new books, just a heads up, things can change. Who knows what's going to happen next week with the, a potential spike in infections or if Diamond is able to bring back enough employees. That's good news. Though. They're at least looking for a date. They're saying, okay, we feel comfortable enough that hopefully soon 
we're ready to start rolling again, but also that they're not just jumping into it and saying, okay, let's just do it right now. Right. Like they, they have a plan in place. They're going to move slowly to get these things back up and running and just letting you guys know every step of the way, like here's where we're at, here's what we're thinking, but it could change. And and that to me means that they really care about their people enough to say, okay, if things still aren't good, even if we get to May 20th, we're pushing that back. So hopefully in about three or four episodes, we will have a proper comic book highlight for you this week. Huge thanks for bearing with us as we make it through all of this. But let's head into our thank yous to those who have made this podcast possible during this period. It is our Patreon shout outs of the week. This week, we have five shout outs. The first one goes out to Alexander, whose Twitter, han- tw- Twitter handle. <laughs> I've had my coffee today. This is so rough. <laughs> Twitter handle is at Swordfish Show and website is purpleswordfish.com. So Al reviewed Brokeback Mountain on his Dead Channel Duo podcast. That was his pick for DCD Film Club. Mm -hmm. And per usual, his co-host Andy did not enjoy Al's pick. But I'm I'm with Al on this one. The thing that I'm kind of trying to keep in mind, Andy is much younger than Al. So he didn't see what the big deal was. He's like, it was an average movie with an average story with a great cast of actors. And Al was talking about how great of a story this was and the prejudices that these characters fell through. And I'm like, I'm on Al's side here because I've lived through that period Mm -hmm. of holy shit, like these various slurs, not just in the gay community, but in in races and everything were way more used when I was a kid and growing up than they are now. Right. So to him, a movie, a gay movie isn't a big deal, but to people who live through that and are like, oh, okay, we, it's, it's pretty clear how easily prejudiced or how do you, I don't know what that word is or bad people can be towards a community of people. That's why I think the movie is more impactful for us. Plus we were also there when it came out in theaters. Oh man. I think his co-host was like 10 or less than that. So (laughs) that's one thing. Uh, What do you think of, of Brokeback? Do you remember watching it? I do. I remember bits and pieces of it. And yeah, it was difficult for me because I grew up in the community in a community that was pretty prejudiced against those type of people. And obviously (laughs) I've I've been (laughs) against Gay Gays, people. Yeah. There you go. Gays. But it's hard when you've grown up in that community and then to understand, okay, the way that they thought is wrong. So when that first came out, yeah, all of my friends were like, did you hear about this movie? Like, it's horrible and all this kind of stuff. I, I do remember liking it when I watched it, but at the same time, I felt so bad for their wives. I'm like, just tell your <laughs> wife. Like, just tell her. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> just, just get it out there and be done and go and be happy, right? So I would have to watch it again and see how it's changed. It's been many, many years since we've watched it. To any newer listen, like younger listeners that kind of don't understand the impact of this, when Heath Ledger was cast in The Dark Knight, the thing I heard openly in stores when, when I was I was working at GameStop at the mall at the time and customer would come in and they'd say, did you hear about Heath Ledger? And I'm like, yeah, he's a great. I had that ca- cafe press shirt printed up mm-hmm. of him as the Joker. Like I was like, he's an amazing actor. And they would say, we're going to get gay Joker now. Can you believe that? We're going to get a gay Joker. And that was a common thing to say when he was cast as as the Joker. So that shows you what kind of impact Brokeback Mountain had back when it released. And I think it won an uh, Academy Award or two. So it was uh, critically acclaimed as well. So I thought that was interesting. And Al and and Andy have a full discussion on that on their weekly podcast, Dead Channel Duo, found on your favorite podcatcher. Thanks, Alexander, for your Patreon support. Next up, we have Lourdes and Katie. Katie's Twitter handle is at CatCatFluffs. And she is graduating. Very exciting. I'm glad graduations are still happening Mm -hmm. in spite of these closures. I know some schools ended up delaying the entire year. So they get, I guess, another year or they work in the summer. I don't know how that's working, but she managed to, I guess, escape that or still plow forward into graduation. So huge congrats to Katie for, for graduating. Next up, we have Bobby, Twitter handle at 
Cuban Slim. Bobby shared the Godzilla alternate art magic cards on Discord. Cool. And those will be the first magic cards I end up buying or owning <laughs> because they are amazing. So like the normal land cards, I guess, would be like the grass type energies and Pokemon. Mm -hmm. And it's got Godzilla roaming the fucking forest and it's got all these different monsters. And I'm like, damn, he pu keeps putting up more and more. So it's like, shit, I'm going to have to try to collect this set. <laughs> they look amazing. And I thought I saw a King Caesar and I don't know if that was just a promo card. But if there's a fucking King Caesar magic card, it, it's amazing. And I think you should check them out. They look really, really cool. I do like Godzilla. Isn't that mm. a weird team up? Like Godzilla with Magic the Gathering? Whatever. He's magical. <laughs> Shoot some magic beams. <laughs> Next shout out goes to John on Instagram at Johnny2Chips. Also has a YouTube podcast called The Dom Chiodo Show. John won an autographed picture of Christian Bale from The Dark Knight Rises. Well done, John. And he did post it up on his Instagram. Once again, at Johnny2Chips, the number two. And our final shout out this week goes out to Neil, whose Twitter handle is at inmats68 or on Instagram at inmats.photography. Neil posted a good reflection shot of the Vitruvian Park Bridge, thanks to the water sitting fairly still. So on that day, the wind wasn't too strong and he was able to get a really nice mm. shot of the bridge. So definitely check it out on inmats.photography on Instagram. So thank you so much, Neil, John, Bobby, Lourdes, and Katie, and Alexander for your Patreon support. If you too would like your shout out, head on over to patreon.com slash the reasons I'm broke. For as little as a dollar a month, you get your shout out every single month. But of course, our podcast will always be free. Best thing you can do is let your friends know about us. When they say, I've run out of podcasts to listen to, you go, boom. Here's another one. <laughs> if you work at the Apple store, subscribe to us on all the <laughs> on devices. all the just, devices. Just ruin the stats. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And also I mentioned that Bobby had put up those Godzilla magic cards on our Discord. That's something that is active every single day. There's a link to our Discord in today's episode. So make sure to jump on our Discord room and chat with the Brocad core who are hilarious. They're funny. Some of those memes they drop are amazing. This man lays in bed at night just giggling. I'm trying <laughs> to sleep. And he's like, hee hee hee. <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on? He's like, just Discord. <laughs> <laughs> Every night. I'm I'm just, I'm not even exaggerating. I'm on my belly, feet kicking up. <laughs> <laughs> like a little teenage girl. <laughs> <laughs> Let's head into the final segment this week. It is the Brokep Block. What Palpa Kelly and I have been doing this week. It was a crazy week. It was a great week. For me, my store did better than it ever has in its entire history. And that's amazing to see given what's going on right now, the pandemic the pandemic that we're in. And really, a lot of the stores in the area are not doing great. If you look at sales versus last year, a lot of my neighboring stores are 60% in the hole. Average is about 30% in the hole versus sales last year. And I'm 3% up. Nice. So uh, my staff is very, very excited. We have like the best customer scores that we've ever had in the store's history and our waste is on par and I'm exhausted because I'm working literally all the time. But again, going back to what I was talking about in the uh, earlier in the show, this is a time where we're understanding what's possible. And before this, I never would have thought that these results were possible. And now I'm just like, if we can do that during this, what can we do when everything's normal? What can we do when I'm fully staffed? What can we do when I'm not having to work all these hours and how do I build my team to maintain that when I'm not working all these hours? So it was really, really great. I feel great about work. I think I had some employees reach out like, hey, how's the store? Like thinking it would be terrible without them. I'm like, it's great. This is all the things they're doing. And they're like, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I was like, listen, you wanted to take this time and we, we just get it done. We just do what we need to do. So that was really, really exciting. We started like curbside pickup. We're the only store in the state that's doing something like that. So definitely making a lot of strides and looking pretty awesome. As part of the store's weekly stream, I read two trade paperbacks this week, the Before Watchmen Silk Spectre and the Minutemen. So what they ended up doing is both are written by the late, great Darwin Cook and those were my two favorite miniseries when those were coming out. I remember you were reading some of those mm -hmm. too. 
And when they compile them together, it makes sense because it's Darwin. They put them all in one trade. So they ended up pairing those two. And I was like, this is fucking perfect because now I only have to buy one trade. I reread those. They are, it's, it's Darwin Cook. It's so fucking good. The Minutemen is amazing. Jimmy and Amanda. Well, I, I don't think Jimmy worked on it, but Amanda was the artist and Darwin wrote the whole story. It gives you the origin of the button. It kind of gives you an insight as to why Silk Spectre is the way she is. And that's also the story in which Jimmy was saying that she was just working for months in her studio. He barely saw her and he was kind of like, you know, all right. And she really dove into this work. And I think he had mentioned that the reason why Amanda doesn't work on any more like Harley books or anything like that is because of that full period that she was working on before mm. Watchmen where they weren't really seeing each other. And it was like that for months. And, you know, she credits his patience on a lot of that, but it really took up so much of her time in working on that book. And it shows in the comic because it is a gorgeous book. It's an important book because it's a prequel to one of the greatest works of fiction of all time, right? The Watchmen. And it was a good read. Uh, did you have any thoughts on Before Watchmen as a whole? I remember liking Minutemen and Silk Spectre, mm -hmm. but it's been so long since I've read them. So if you could say, hey, give me a detail about it, I'd be like, I remember the hooded guy and he wasn't as evil as we thought he was. Right. That's all I remember. But it was it was very good when we read it. That I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have the opportunity, yeah, definitely pick up that trade. I also read the Justice League of America Tower of Babel written by Mark Wade. This is the one that Justice League Doom is based mm -hmm. on. But in the comic, Ra's al Ghul is the main villain as opposed to Vandal Savage. And I still don't know why they changed them because Ra's would have worked just the same, if not better, in the animated movie. But in that one, it's the story of Batman has a contingency plan for every member of the Justice League just in case something happens and they go rogue. Well, this is the comic of, all right, is that safe to have? And someone took his plans and used it against the Justice League. Well, thankfully, Batman had a plan just in case someone took his plans and was able to save the day. Of course. But it answers, it asks that question. It's almost like, should Batman be allowed to have these plans if they can so easily be taken from him? Batman doesn't need to be allowed to do anything. <laughs> Batman can That's do whatever true. he wants. Yeah. Or Well, this panel does happen in the book where Superman tells him, and of course, you had no plan for uh, for yourself in case something like this did happen. And they, it played out so well in the animated movie where he goes, the plan was the Justice League. My contingency plan is you guys. But clearly, it's like Superman's so dumb that he doesn't realize if he ever went rogue, he already has a plan to take all of you out. So clearly, the Justice League is not the plan to take out Batman. It's the easiest lie to see through him. And Superman just takes it, smiles, and they go off. It's the funniest fucking thing. <laughs> Well, we don't know how Batman would go rogue. Maybe he wouldn't be taking out the Justice League. I wasn't picking up the single issues of Justice League of America by Mark Wade or even Grant Morrison when they were releasing, but I do think Tower of Babel is a great one to own, not only if you're into the Justice League, but if you're a Batman fan, because it's just cool to see those plans enacted and Batman kind of figuring things out. We also spent this week watching a lot of Dragon Ball Zo Super. Uh, Super. <laughs> Dragon Ball Super. <laughs> Because you're trying to finish that before you go back to work, before mm. this free trial ends. Right. Yeah, there's that free trial for Funimation, and it, I'm, not a, I'm not a weeb. I don't watch anime. So I'm like, let me finish off Dragon Ball Super. I'm in the manga right now where they're fighting Jiren, mm -hmm. and then in the anime, it's way different. So I'm going to say I'm watching this out of, let me just finish the anime because I've seen almost all of it. I didn't see GT. But I've seen all of Super, I've seen all of Dragon Ball Z, so I might as well finish Super and knock it all out. Since so far, it looks like they're not going to be making any more Dragon Ball anime cartoons, but the manga's still going. And comparing the two, holy shit, the manga is a million times better. I don't know what kind of process they go through in making the anime, but there's so many episodes that drag, that are filler, that don't move like the story along. You mean like it's always been where they power up for three episodes? Yeah, I know Dragon Ball Z was way worse at it than Super was, but I thought they were fixing that. Like they did that with Kai where they cut down, they trimmed mm -hmm. all the fat and it just left it with the plot. And I'm like, all right, well, maybe because of the way they work now between the manga and the anime, they can do the same. But they veered off completely. So if they're already not going to follow the manga, 
then why is there so much filler? And maybe it's because it's by its very own nature, it's an anime and it's going to do that. And it's because I'm not an avid anime watcher that I don't understand that. So that's probably what it is. But I'm also sitting here like, all right, let's get to the next fucking thing. Let's get to the other battle. I don't care about these two fighting. And in the manga itself, though, it's all very streamlined. It moves along. It's nice. It's well paced. And the character development is a lot stronger. You saw like Roshi, he ends up going off the, the tournament of power ring by Vegeta telling him, get out, old man, before you croak. And Roshi apologizes for letting Vegeta get captured in the little genie thing. And he throws himself off the little ring. In the manga, he fights fucking Jiren. He uses Ultra Instinct to almost have his own against Jiren. And Jiren himself is taken aback by this. And that's when Roshi says, if I was younger, I could have taken out this guy. And Jiren puts him away himself and says, this was your master, Goku. And he has respect for Roshi for being Goku's master. So it's amazing. And then you as a Vegeta fan... Vegeta goes up against Jiren, lands a couple blows, and and tells him, I'm not like Goku. I didn't have a master. I didn't train among all these different people. I had to figure all of this myself. And Jiren respects that because he relates more to Vegeta than he does to Goku. So there's just so much more going on in the manga that I appreciate, that I like, than the cartoon. So those are kind of my frustrations between those two. But what have been your thoughts on the anime? It's just taking forever <laughs> to get to anything. Like, we have been, we have this 48-minute tournament, right? <laughs> That's taken seven hours. <laughs> and even they, we watched one episode, it was a few episodes ago, and it said, there's nine minutes left. And I was like, oh, man, nine minutes. And then it's been an hour and a half, and they're like, there's six minutes left. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? So I wish they just would have said it was hours long tournament instead of this. And then I'm also not understanding, I'm like, why don't you guys just hide and wait for the time to run out? <laughs> why? <laughs> But whatever. Well, it's a show. I mean, that they need to have them fighting. They're not going to have them hiding. Frieza hides. He does. He kind of hangs out. Frieza's, Frieza's okay. the best in the fucking, both in the anime they, and the manga. Listen, I will say when they brought him back for Dragon Ball Super, they made him hilarious. Yes. He's Because I hated him in Z. I'm like, he's just a terrible person. Yeah. But now he's just fucking hilarious. He's so funny. That's Yeah, that's the best bit. He's still evil and mm. he keeps trying to make certain deals, but he makes them in favor of his own universe still. So in there's still like, I don't know if there's, there's not good in him, but there's self-interest, I guess I right. would say. And when he gives Goku energy, he does it to, in the interest of him getting his life back and now no longer being, you know, a member of whatever they call it after the afterworld or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to continue to get stronger and to actually exist again and not be in hell. So that's why he's working. Even when he saved Goku from going out of the ring, he kicks him back into the <laughs> ring. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I loved the the moment when he's trying to make a deal with whatever universe they're fighting now. And he's like, I'll help you if you guys wish me back to life. And then Beerus is and Stan's going, there he goes again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when Curlin's like, don't be so sure. He might be fooling him because we know how dirty Frieza is. And it's like, but he's doing it for you guys. Right. <laughs> and he did. And we saw that when he fought against Frost. It's like his older, even himself in another universe, his own counterpart, he betrays. And mm. he tells him. You're you're less seasoned than I am because you shouldn't trust anyone. Fucking kicks him out of the ring. Amazing. Fucking in the manga, it differs where he tells him you should fight, and then once you are all tapped out, then I will I will fight instead, and we'll fight all the universes, even my own. And when Frost gets tired, that's when he tells him don't trust anyone, and he kicks him out of the <laughs> fucking ring. <laughs> Thanks for doing all my dirty work for exactly. me. Exactly, that's exactly what he does, and it's a very naive Frost, right, mm -hmm. compared to this Frieza. So I I love Frieza regardless. Like in this last, in the Broly movie, he's amazing, but in this arc for Tournament of Power. I am saying he's the best part. <laughs> Any Frieza scene is hilarious. They have definitely done more character development in Super, though, than I feel that they ever have before. And yeah, you're saying maybe it's more in the manga, mm -hmm. but I have still enjoyed watching like all the Vegeta Bulma moments where you really get to see their relationship and, and how it functions. And that, yeah, he really is a good dad because he knows how to change a diaper and he wants to be there for his wife and daughter. You cannot tell me that at any point, Bulma was like, no, you can't run off while I'm pregnant. He was the one saying <laughs> like, I'm not leaving till my kid gets here because he missed the first kid. Yeah, that's true. He did. And that's kind of a weird 
thing with Vegeta because, and that's one thing in the manga too <laughs> that I'm going to point out. In the show, he's like, no, I'm not. And he trains in the little chamber or whatever. Mm-hmm. In the manga, they show him training while he's folding clothes. So as he's doing tasks around the house, he's using that as training where he's trying to get his body to move quicker than his mind. So as he's folding the shirts, he's trying, he's training there too, mm-hmm. which I wish they had done in the show uh, as well. And I think you would have too. Yeah. I would. <laughs> oh, Dad Jita. So cool. We should finish that up probably this week for mm-hmm. sure, though. And I will talk about the comic store. We were doing the two days open. As of next week, the plan is I will be back on still the limited payroll, but I'll at least be back on five days a week, which is huge. It's a it's a really good sign. I'm really, really happy to be back on that and grateful that we <laughs> out can- Out of the house, not watching kids all day. It was it, many weeks of that. Yeah, it was many weeks of that. And- and I, I, as you mentioned before, it's like I'm about ready to go back to work and to start doing things, getting back into that routine and getting the shop back up to its feet along with everyone else and serving whatever, you know, customers need, whatever trades and gift certificates or whatever. People want to go in and look at back issues. Like mm-hmm. we've been doing that curbside and several times people have been like, can I just look through the back issues? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I wish, you know, because mo- moving more product and everything. So that's one thing that, as of next week, it'll be at least limited open for the shop, which is going to help us out a lot. And hopefully slowly we'll get back to regular payroll, regular sales, just in time for a regular uh, new comic book day. And I will say to anyone that upped their pledge on Patreon, we really appreciate it. If you And if, if you need to go back to what you were normally pledging for, please do. Because as of next week, I'm at least back on a regular payroll and no longer relying on uh, unemployment or on any assistance from, from places like bank. So hu- hugely appreciated helping us last month, but I totally get it. Put your bracket back down to what it needs to be, and and th- everything's great. <laughs> you know the podcast is is paid for, and that assistance last month definitely helped me out personally mm-hmm. on the uh, on making ends meet. So huge thanks to the Brokehead Core that stepped up and helped us out with that. That does wrap up our show for this week. A little bit shorter than we normally have, but I'm sure we'll make up for it. Some I will go on plenty of rabbit trails soon enough, and y'all be like, oh. Kelly, come on. And I would say, no, these are great things to talk about. (laughs) So thank you all so much for tuning in this week. I've been Magma Admin Daniel. And I am your Emperor Palp Kelly. And Brocad Core. All All will be be well. well. I wish they would just make a manga of just Dad Jita. How many volumes could that run? So many. Just you could do like little short stories of him just doing stuff around the house and him and Bulma and it would be so cute. In GT, do you remember that Dad Jita moment where he's driving with Bola? Yeah, and, and he has guys... a gross mustache. <laughs> well, the guys are hollering at her because she's like winking at them or whatever. And mm-hmm. then he blasts their fucking car. <laughs> <laughs> he fucking kills them. <laughs> it's a Dad Jita moment. He's, he's a pretty great Dad Jita. I'm so happy that they've turned him around. Well, if they can do that with Yamcha in that what if oh story, God, then they Yamcha. can do a Dad Jita manga. They need to. Get on that. Call some people. But it's got to be like Chibi Dad Jita. There are actually a ton of fan comics where it's just Dad Jita and his kids. Oh, I bet. Oh, my God. They're so cute. Yeah, I've seen I've seen one panel where he's helping Trunks, Kid Trunks, with his homework, and then he's he's like feeding Bola with the yeah. other. And I'm like, I don't think he would do that. I'm so pretty like, sure he not. would. Calm down, <laughs> calm down. Did you ever? Okay, before Super, did you? Would you, were you ever like, oh yeah, Vegeta will change a diaper? No, probably not. No, and maybe some Vegeta fans are pissed off at that, where they're like, no, he's the prince of all Saiyans. I don't think he would go through that. But I think most Vegeta fans have accepted that he's grown over the years in the arts. Thank you. Like, it's really cool. He has. You brought up Yamcha, so now I got to bring this up for this post credits thing. How good was that baseball episode? <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> where he one Vegeta beans him with the fucking ball because <laughs> Vegeta thinks that that's how you play baseball is you defeat them with the baseball, <laughs> and then he ends up winning the game for the team by when he gets to home he's in a crater just like when he died in that same pose. You gotta like Yamcha for that at least. <laughs> it was. Pretty amazing. I love that Vegeta's like, ah, I'm just going to destroy this guy. <laughs> but clearly still not jealous that he was with Bulma at some point because he's like, ah, oh, this guy's insignificant. Like, 
He's nothing. <laughs> Non-threat. Non-threat. I do like when Yamcha's sitting around waiting for people to come invite him to the Tournament of Power. Right. And they never do. Never does. 